think you could do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord. I may put you to sleep, but I want to start out with you awake. Is that, does that sound like a fair plan? Praise God. Well, as you can see from your bulletin, uh, Elder Darrell Bentley, uh, they say, well, okay, that tells us your name, but it doesn't tell us who you are. Who are you? Fair question. I'm happy to answer that for you. Uh, I have the privilege of serving as the Associate Ministerial Director for the Carolina Conference. So, well, what does that mean? Well, let's define it a little further. Uh, ministerial Director is someone who has the privilege of being a pastor to the pastors. And so through the week, uh, my job, my assignment, my privilege is to be able to work with our pastors across North and South Carolina to support our pastors, to try to be a blessing to them, to try to encourage, mentor, train, uh, pray with our pastors, help them work through issues, all of those things that can help our pastors be the very best that they can be for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Uh, I've had the privilege of pastoring myself for almost 14 years. Ginger and I most recently moved back from Michigan. We're originally from North Carolina, grew up in North Carolina, came to know this beautiful truth in North Carolina. But when we finished up over at Southern Adventist University, the Lord sent us to be missionaries to the north. And so we've been serving in Michigan. Uh, a lot of wonderful people up there that we've come to know and love. But Jan December 1st, we were called back to the Carolina Conference. And so we just praise God we get to come and serve here where we both came to know the truth. Amen. Now, through the week, I've told you what I do. You say, well, Pastor, that doesn't explain why you're here today. Well, I sent out an email to all of our pastors, and I said, brothers, sisters, if you have a need in your church, I would love the opportunity to come and get to meet your church family. Here's what I don't want to happen for me. I don't want to be sitting at the conference office talking about the Greenwood, South Carolina, Seventh-day Adventist Church, and have no idea who you folks are. I want to know who you are. I want to know that I sat through Selena and Charlie Sabbath School, and I was blessed. I want to know what you're all about as a church family as much as I can on a Sabbath where I'm allowed to come and visit. Of course, met Justin and their families that are coming in the door, beautiful kids. And I have to agree, the young man back here during the children's story, I was right there with you, brother. If you had the dream, that really happened, right? And so I was glad you brought some clarification to the story. But I will have some fond memories. Ginger will have some fond memories so that when we're thinking about your church, we at least know you a little bit. And when you hear our names, we want you to know who we are, that we're brothers and sisters with you, that we're here to uplift your arms, to encourage you to be a blessing to your church family as much as possible. And so, praise God, each weekend we've had the privilege of speaking at a different church around North and South Carolina, and we're very happy to be in Greenwood. And I'm going to tell you, I was happy to be in where it was dry and stable last night when the storm was blowing through. And I'm glad, Selena, I wasn't at your house. Folks trying to break in and stuff, so I'm glad you made it this morning. But as we get started today, the message, of course, is what's most important. It's not about me. It's about what has God given us. Amen? Amen. And so I want to begin with a word of prayer, if you permit me to do so, because I have come to believe something very sincerely, that without God's help, I really have nothing of any value to share. But with His help, we can break life unto life, all right? Bring the bread of life. So let's pray to God. Loving Father, oh Lord, we praise you, we thank you, we glorify you. You've told us, come into my courts with thanksgiving. And so, Father, we do want to praise you. And Lord, I thank you for the Greenwood Church here. Just a warm, welcoming, loving church family that has received me and Miss Ginger so graciously. But Lord, now we want to open the word. And Father, I want the Word to take center stage because it's your Word that we read in Hebrews 4.12 that is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and able to change lives. So Father, please forgive me where I have failed. Forgive me where I have fallen. Please wash over me afresh with the blood of Jesus. Take away all of my sin, any tendency to sin, and Lord, hide me behind the cross in this moment that I might just be your mouthpiece, but that Jesus will shine through. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters. Many come to this church this morning perhaps with burdens, with concerns, maybe even distractions. Help us to set those things at the altar, that we might come collectively as the body of Christ and worship our God this morning. So Father, thank you for blessing, for being in our midst, and we ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Quick show of hands. How many of you have a cell phone? Let me 
sim, I, I've got one of those devices too. How many of you remember the days before we had cell phones? Right? It, it doesn't seem like it was that far back, but now all of a sudden we're like, how did we live without them? And they're beautiful devices. I, I, I mean, I, I'm very much thankful for mine. It allows, uh, you can see my phone's over on the stand here. So I'll say hello to whoever may be watching with us on Facebook. It allows us to do a lot of things. But I'm going to tell you, those things can also kill us. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, I want to tell you a story, if I may. I'm going to take you back in time to 2011. Ish. Ginger and I had been to North Carolina. We were currently serving in Michigan, and we were returning back to Michigan after a family visit in Carolina. We're driving along. Ginger's at the wheel. I'm over there reading or looking at something. We're on our way back. We're just minutes. We, I mean, 15 minutes, if that. We had just left her folks home. And as we're driving along, we're behind a concrete mixer. You know the trucks I'm talking about, right? It's got this big drum that's spinning. They're just big, beefy, monstrous trucks. And we're following this truck along. And we're not right up on top of them or anything, but we're behind this concrete mixer. And as we're going along, the little dolly wheels that had been dropped in the back to help when the load is heavier, those wheels begin to skip. You know that rubber sound as it skips across the pavement? Those wheels begin, those tires begin to lock up. And that truck goes off the road, starts diving towards the right shoulder, but here's the problem, there wasn't much shoulder because as the shoulder went off, then the bank went up. So the truck was obviously going off the road or trying to get off the road, but he had nowhere to go. And just as we see this, Ginger says, what is this truck doing? No sooner than those words had gotten off of her lips, all of a sudden, Fluids and a little white vehicle came spinning around sideways because that vehicle, if this is the cement mixer, that vehicle had struck a glancing blow and hit that truck nearly head on. It struck that cement mixer with such an impact that the single mother who was driving that vehicle was impaled by the vehicle as it folded into her. To add insult to that injury, her seat was pushed back against a car carrier that was strapped into the back seat. And the little six-month-old baby's car carrier was nearly upside down. So as this vehicle comes to a stop, plastic and glass and fluids are just all over, we're stunned. We finally get our bearings and we race out of our vehicle to go over and try to see if we can offer assistance. The mother was completely out of her mind. She had no real cognition or understanding. Ginger's trying to console her. I get out my pocket knife and I start trying to cut the seat belts to release the little car carrier that's nearly upside down. It's a horrific scene. Emergency services are called. We momentarily place the little car carrier with the baby who's not making any noise. Good sign or bad sign? A baby that's just had a traumatic experience should be crying. Baby's not crying. Emergency services come. It had already been drizzling rain just a little bit, but of course it started pouring rain. They had to use the jaws of life to cut the roof off of this vehicle and Unfortunately, by the time they were able to actually get to the mother and start extracting her, the mother perished on the scene. The baby was put in the first ambulance, was rushed towards Hickory. They were going to then airlift the child to Carolina's Medical Center in Charlotte. We later learned that the baby died in the route. We followed the news from a distance, looked at the Hickory Daily Record online, and come to find out the reason that this single mother with a six-month-old baby perished needlessly on a country Carolina highway was because she was driving with one hand and texting with the other. And because her focus was diverted from where it should have been, she veers over into oncoming traffic. The cement mixer driver, he sees it coming, has nowhere to go. If only there had been a field, right, that he could have ran the mixer off into, I know he would have done so. But he was trapped, and she hit him. 
He was not injured, of course. This monster cement mixer was not injured, damaged in any way. But a single mom and a six-month-old baby lost their lives because mom was not focused. Have you ever driven beside somebody who's not focused? I don't want you to raise your hands. I don't want to impugn your character or call you out. But have you been the one beside someone not paying attention and drifting over into their lane? And sometimes it's not the cell phone, right? Sometimes it's we're eating something. Sometimes it's, it's our child needing some assistance. I've seen people swerving before because they've got one hand on the wheel and, and they're reaching behind trying to do something to help their child. Whatever the reason, that mom and baby lost their lives. About a few years later, there was a lady who reached out to me on Facebook, and she said, are you the Pastor Bentley who tried to help so-and-so? I said, yes, ma'am. I responded back, and she said, that was my daughter and granddaughter. And she sent me a picture of mom and baby Rose the week before they had lost their lives. Mm. I'm going to tell you, we had to stop driving. We pulled over. We just kind of, I remember Ginger and I and the kids, our kids were small. We've got two boys with a girl in the middle. Our kids were small. They didn't know what was happening. We went to an olive garden here in Hickory, and we just kind of sat quietly staring at each other. It breaks your heart to see those kind of things happen. How much more so do you think it breaks the heart of he who created us? How much more so do you think it breaks the heart of he who created us, who has also gone to prepare a place for us? And why are we told in Scripture that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us? Because he wants to be apart from us or because he wants to be with us? He wants to be with us. So I wonder today, if you looked at the title of today's sermon, it's called Stay Focused. I wonder if biblically we have been called to stay focused. And I believe that we have. I want you to go with me if you would. We're going to open up the scriptures to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. In Greenwood Church, I know you don't know me very well, but I want you to talk to me today. Right? If I ask a question, please speak out. If you feel something move your heart, don't be afraid to say an amen. All right? We don't have to be the frozen chosen on Sabbath morning. We can have a discussion this morning. What do you say? Amen. Praise God. All right. So 1 Corinthians. Did you hear which chapter? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and I want you to go with me to verse 19, and just give me a little amen when you're there. 1 Corinthians 9, and which verse? 19. 19. When you're there, just say amen. amen. If you need more time, say have mercy. I'll wait on you. I get paid by the month. Are you ready? Here we go. I'll be sharing with you today from the New King James Version. Follow along in whichever translation blesses you. For though I am, what? Free from how many people? Talk to me, saints. All men. I have made myself a what? A servant to how many? Why? What is his purpose? He states the purpose at the end of the verse. That I might do what? Gain or win the more. In other words... Even though I don't owe you anything, even though I have no obligation to you in a legal sense, he says, I have made myself a servant to all for the sole purpose of what? That I might win people to the gospel. Hmm. Then he notice how he blends. He shifts. He's a bit of a spiritual chameleon, if you will. But he never makes, makes those changes with compromise. But he says, to the Jews, I became as a Jew. Why? That I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. So when I'm around Jewish believers who believe they're, they're saved by keeping the law, I know how to act around those kind of people. That's what he's saying. Verse 21, are you still with me? To those who are without law, as without law, and not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ. So he's very clear to make sure, listen, I didn't live or act in such a way as I dismissed the word of God, right? I don't compromise spiritually, but I'm going to try to reach you as far as I can. Did Jesus do this same thing? Did he hang out with people that society said you shouldn't hang out with? He mingled with men. He mingled among men as one who desired their good. 
we're told in ministry of healing, page 143. Okay? He wanted to be with people. Now, look at verse 22. Verse 22 to me is profound. To the weak, I became as weak. Now, we may look at that and we may think, well, that's talking about physicality. Right? That's talking about people who are puny. I would suggest to you that it's talking about people who are living without control over their lives. Let me, let me give you an example of a weakness that you and I have. How many of you filled up your gas tank this week? I drive a Jeep Grand, Grand Cherokee that has a 24-gallon tank. And I was sitting there. I was so thankful that my loan got approved so I could get a tank of gas. Yes. I don't know about you, but I feel pretty powerless at the pump. How much power do you and I have to change what's happening at the pump? Right? There are certain areas of our lives where we have no power to influence or, or, or impact a change. There are certain things that happen I can't control. Any prior service people here? Do I have any veterans in, in, my, in my midst? Okay, my brother here, what branch did you serve with? Okay, Navy, I was Army. When you were given an order, <coughs> how much power did you have to change that order if it was a lawful order? You had one response. Yes, sir. Or yes, ma'am, depending on who's given the order, right? We had the same thing in the Army. There's what I'm saying. Paul says to those who in society had very little impact over themselves, had very little autonomy over themselves, I didn't come in as someone who was free and just passing through. I, as to the weak, I acted as the weak. I made myself as one of them. And notice again, why does he do this? Why did he go to the Jews as one of the Jews under the law? Why did he go to those without the law as one without the law? Why did he go to the weak? He tells us over and over that I might win who? The weak. I have become all things to all men that by all means I save some. And then I love verse 23. He clarifies this very deeply. I do this for the gospel's sake. Now notice the last part of verse 23. Look at verse 23 again with me. He says, I do this for the gospel's sake, that I might be a what? Partaker. A partaker of it with you. In other words, catch this principle, saints. Here's a big principle that we as Seventh-day Adventists sometimes forget. Part of how my salvation is affected is being a witness to share salvation with others. Amen. You say, well, pastor, that's heresy. That sounds like a system of works. That's not what I'm saying. Hold your finger here in 1 Corinthians 9 and turn with me to Revelation chapter 12 and go to verse 11. Don't lose your place in Corinthians. We're just going to bounce over to Revelation very quickly and we're going to come right back. Revelation 12, in which verse? Verse 11. When you get there, let me know you're there. Amen. It says, for they overcame him. Who is him referring to? It's the accuser of the brethren in verse 10. The accuser of the brethren is the devil, the Satan, the serpent of old, right? He's the one accusing the brethren. They overcame him. What was the first way that they overcame the devil? Blood of the lamb. Blood of the lamb. So in other words, your first and foremost stance of getting salvation is under the bloodstained banner of Jesus. Amen? Amen. But then notice, what is the next step at keeping the devil at bay? The word of their testimony. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. By the word of their testimony, in other words, they were able to keep their eyes focused on Jesus because they were constantly telling somebody what Jesus had done for them. <coughs> How many times do we have been as Christians get discouraged? But if we were sharing our faith, it would keep the experience fresh. Amen. If we were sharing what Jesus has done, it would keep the connection alive. If we lived our lives with the expectation that I've been called to share, I've been called to witness, I've been called to testify of Jesus. You see, it totally changes our perspective. Bounce back with me now to 1 Corinthians 9. I believe that that same underpinning, that same understanding Paul is promoting here. I do what I do. I share the gospel with all of these groups. I try to become all things to all people for one reason. That they might be one and that I may be a partaker of it with you. 
by being a faithful witness, it keeps me connected to Jesus. Are you tracking with me, saints? Does that make sense? So what's the inverse of that equation? If I claim to love Jesus, but I never share my faith, what is that doing to my faith?
Here are a few more pages. If you need more time, just say, have mercy. All right, that's okay. Go for it. Philippians 3 and verse 12. Praise the Lord. Here we go. Now notice, he's writing now to the church in Philippi. Same author, right? So we would expect consistency, yes or no? It's the same author sharing the same message. There should be some consistency. He says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. <coughs> Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. In other words, I don't have all the answers. I haven't got it all figured out. I haven't arrived. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. How many of you beat yourselves up? Don't raise your hands, but how many times in your life have you felt that you couldn't do something because of what you had already done? Mm. And I'll tell you, if God can use me, he can use any of you. And I'll tell you, when I first got called to pastoral ministry, I, I had not come from a Christian background. I wasn't raised Christian other than a generic belief that God existed. The only time we celebrated Christmas was to get gifts, and Easter was about these baskets with pagan egg representations in it. Are you with me? Didn't know anything about it. You know, every funeral I went to, everybody got preached to heaven. So, I mean, no matter how you live, when you die, you must go to heaven. That's all I knew. So, as I think about what's behind me, leaving things in the past, as I became a pastor, I had a guy reach out to me on Facebook that I went to high school with, and he sent me this message. So many of you love this. He said, how desperate was your church that they asked you to be a pastor? <laughs> Did the brother know a little something about my past? Did he know a little bit of how I acted in the past? He did. But aren't you so glad that I can leave all that garbage behind me? I can have a fresh start with Jesus Christ. Can you say amen to that? And notice, I love how Paul brings that out. He says, forgetting those things which are behind. Think about some of the things Paul had to forget. What did we know of the brother Saul before he became Paul? What do we know about his intent on heading down the road to Damascus? He says that he was still breathing threats and murder. How many families had he seen, had he commanded soldiers to drag out of their homes, kicking and screaming? Families torn apart as they're thrown into the jails and dungeons around the region. How many were executed because of Saul's zeal to serve God in the way that he felt that he should? In fact, based on modern standards, we would have looked at Saul as a zealous murderer. Yes or no? Do you think he had some things he would like to leave in the past? I mean, what happened when it was time for the prophet to come and take away his blindness? What was the prophet's reaction? <laughs> you mean Saul? You mean that brother was trying to kill me? You mean that brother that's had other people thrown in prison? No, 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 just go. Faithful was the prophet who went and baptized Saul to become Paul, the greatest writer. Praise God, he comes to me and he comes to you and he says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Now notice it comes back into focus. Verse 14, I press toward the goal for the what, saints? For the prize. What is the prize? He goes on to explain it. He fleshes it out a little further. He says the prize is the upward call of who? God in Christ Jesus. Saints, I don't know about you, but if you think of the privilege that you and I have been given as Christians to take the three angels' messages to a world that's dying without a Savior. Wow. You know that we're told in spirit of prophecy that the angels would love to be doing what we've been called to do? But you know, God's called us to do it. Why? Because part of the process is that we will get distracted we will get blindsided. We will veer over into oncoming spiritual traffic and we'll get destroyed. God wants us to stay focused. And he says one of the ways you're going to stay focused is just those spiritual disciplines of prayer and Bible study. But you're also going to stay focused. You're going to stay looking towards the prize 
by sharing what God has done for you, sharing what Christ has done for you. The question is, are we sharing? Is God still in the business of making divine appointments? Amen. I believe he is. I can tell you several stories. I'll tell you one just quickly and we'll keep moving. Ginger and I are in Michigan. We're pastoring. She sends me a list to go to the grocery store. One of the things I hate most in this life is being sent to a grocery store for my wife. <laughs> Any other men relate to that? Oh, mercy. Come on now. You don't even like going. Okay. Well, she probably doesn't like going either, but she, she sends me. And so because I love her, I'm going to go. But I come into the grocery store, and as I come into the grocery store, first thing she has on there is bread. I knew what bread to get, but when I get there, the bread aisle has this little old lady walking back and forth, kind of mumbling to herself, staring off in space a little bit, back and forth, she's got the whole bread aisle blocked. <laughs> and so I'm, you know, there, I don't really want to be there, my mind wasn't in a ministry focus, and here's this woman just aimlessly walking back and forth in front of the bread. My first reaction was, lady, pick some bread and move on. she walked, the Holy Spirit then began to move. Maybe there's an opportunity here, ma'am. So finally I spoke to the woman and I said, ma'am, is everything okay? And I shook her out of her little stupor. And she said, well, excuse me? I said, ma'am, are you okay? You're just kind of going back and forth in front of the bread. Is there something I can help you find? She said, oh, no, I, I know what I'm supposed to get. She said, I lost my husband two weeks ago. And this is where we would come to shop. And when I came in, all I could do was think about him. And I just kind of forgot what I was doing. And you could just see the pain. How raw, how fresh. That pain, that loss was on her face. And I could have said to her, well, I hate that you lost it. And the bread you need is probably over there. Let me get mine and I'll get it you want. I took it as an opportunity to ask her. I said, would you, would you mind if I just offered a word of prayer for you here? She said, I would very much appreciate that. So right there at the entrance of the supermarket, standing in front of the bread aisle, yes, we were blocking somebody else probably. <laughs> I just put my arm around her shoulder, and I prayed for God to give her peace through her grief. She was crying. She gave me a little hug. We both got our bread and moved on. But God gave me a divine appointment that I almost missed because I was more worried about having to be in the store where I didn't want to be. How many opportunities do we miss because we're not tuned in, we're not focused on what God would have us be doing? Now, what is this upward call? I'm not going to take time to turn you there, but I want you to recall a passage with me. Some of the Adventists we should know, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, do you remember? Verse 13, Paul begins, he says, Brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep. Do you remember the passage? It says, for the Jesus went, right? He's going to come again and take those with him to be with God. And I love what he says. For the Lord himself shall descend with a shout, with a trumpet blast. And then what happens to the dead, verse 16 tells us? The dead in Christ shall rise first. No, I have to pause. I have to push the pause button one quick second. How does God shouting, blasting his trumpet, and bringing bodies up out of the earth all over the place, how is that secret? Again, now I'm going to evangelism here. But imagine that scene. Jesus comes. The sky rolls back. He gives his call to put life back into his faithful. They are risen into the air. They're with Jesus. And then I love verse 17. Then we that are alive and remain shall be caught up with them in the air. And thus we shall always be. And what does verse 18 say? Therefore comfort one another with these words. Saints, does that sound like an upward call? Does that sound like a prize worth receiving? Does that sound like a reunion that you want to be a part of? Yes. I don't know the history of the Greenwood Church, but did you lose anybody during this pandemic? Have you said goodbye to some friends too soon? Have you said goodbye to some loved ones too soon? I want to be a part of that reunion. How about you? Amen. But I also like how this upward call, the call is eventually to receive eternal life. But what is the call until we receive eternal life? It's to live eternal life in the present. 
What does the Lord's Prayer teach us? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in the future as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. Is that what it says? No. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Now, in the present, I can embrace eternity right now, yes or no? I am living eternal life right now if I have Jesus, yes or no? Yes. It's my foretaste of the promise. That's the other one called. That's the prize. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians and let's finish unpacking this beautiful passage back in 1 Corinthians 9. I promise I'll have you out of here by 2 p.m., so don't worry. Amen. We'll plenty of time. Is that a full day? If I finished at 12.15, would that still be before 2 p.m.? See, I'm going to mess with you just a little bit. i got to make sure you're staying with me. <laughs> Ask who? Jonah. Ask Jonah that question. Did that brother keep me straight? Uh, this, this, me and this guy's on the same page. I like this brother. All right, so we're back in 1 Corinthians 9. So now we've defined the prize, right? That prize is eternal life. That prize is the upward call. Run that you might receive that prize. But what does that look like? He now fleshes out. He now spells out a little bit for us what it means to run for that prize. And I praise God that it has nothing to do with marathons. Can anybody say amen to that? Anyone, everyone, verse 25, 1 Corinthians 9, who competes for the prize is what? Temperate in all things. Oh, wait a minute. Preacher's about to go, about fixing to go from preaching to mammon. Is that what's about to happen? What is temperance? Do we talk about temperance? Is temperance that's something people want to hear about. What is temperance? I heard it defined this way one time. Temperance is staying away from all the bad things and only enjoying the good things in moderation. That could be part of it. Can I suggest it maybe a little fuller definition that temperance is only partaking in the things that God has ordained? Right? Because we can just say, what's well, good? Well, good, your opinion might one thing be good. I happen to like dark chocolate. Anybody in here more of a milk chocolate fan than they are dark chocolate? Okay, yeah, my wife's more milk chocolate. I'm more dark chocolate. I like just the, the less sweet or, you know, a little bit more bitter taste. We can argue about opinions, right? So we've got to get away from that. We have to ask the question, what is temperance in God's eyes? Well, it's going to be the things that God has ordained, the things that God has said we should partake of. That's our diet. That's everything. So, well, Pastor, how do you know that? Well, I've read 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you recall it? Verse 19 in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul writes, Know you not that your body is the what? Temple of the Holy Spirit, and that you are not your own. You have bought, been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Yes or no? Now, what else has he said? In the same book, the very next chapter, if you want to look down to verse 31 of chapter 10, take just a second and read it for yourself. 1 Corinthians 10, we're in 9, look forward just to one page or so. Verse 31, therefore, whether you eat or drink, still sounds like a focus on diet, or what? Whatever you Whatever. Do. Oh, there's the catch-all. It's not just about diet. And listen, saints, I'm not one of these people that's hung up on, I have salvation by my diet. I've met people who that's how they have a metric of holiness. Well, you're still eating this, so you're not holy enough. Another quick story. I'm working at Southern Adventist University. Any, any of you guys been over to Southern's campus? There's a little grocery store right across the street from the college. It's called the Village Market. Anybody been to the Village Market? My best friend and I were there. We're working in the Village Market, and they had these little Morningstar sausage biscuits. They're in the deli. And whoever made those biscuits knew how to make a biscuit. I mean, it was, it was a good biscuit. And they would microwave that little morning star sausage patty and that biscuit for you for about 25 seconds. Smear a little mayonnaise on that. Oh, first. <laughs> My buddy and I were there. We were looking at those sausage biscuits. They had two left. And he said, you know, I wonder if they put a slice of cheese on them for us. And I said, well, let's ask. That sounds amazing. So the lady comes up. Can I help you, boys? Yes, ma'am. We'd, uh, we'd love to have a slice of cheese on that morning star biscuit and have you microwave it. Well, I hope you don't love it too much. What? And my buddy said, excuse me? Well, I hope you don't love that cheese 
too much, you know it's wholly unfit for food. This woman didn't know us from Adam. She didn't know if we were somebody from the community or if we're a customer, if we work there, students, whatever. She just lays into us. Well, she really got a little upset. And he said to her, well, you know Jesus probably ate cheese. Here was her response. I'll never forget it. Well, he didn't have the spirit of prophecy. <laughs> Absolutely wanted to lose my mind. <laughs> you mean to tell me he who created the spirit of prophecy didn't have the spirit of prophecy? Are you insane? Is what I'm going to say. Yes. We decided that it was best left undone and said we'd like the cheese and we'd like to have our biscuits. Since I'm not talking about let's create some sort of holiness metric about what somebody, listen, let people journey with God. Is diet important? Yes or no? Yes. yes. And I'm going to be very transparent with you. First of the year, Ginger and I decided to start working with a health coach. First of the year, I'm going to make a confession to you, and I hope that you won't think less of me, but I want to be transparent with you. First of the year, I weighed 313 pounds. Now, if you're five seven, you've got one of two problems. You're either too fat or too short. <laughs> and since I'm not likely to grow any higher at 47, what was I? Say it out loud. What was I? You're afraid to hurt my feelings. You're too subtle. <laughs> too fat. Should I do something about it if I want to honor God in my body? So Ginger and I decided to work with a health coach. We started making some changes in our diet. We've been following the counsel of our health coach. We reported to her weekly. And do you know that I can praise God that as of Friday morning, I was down almost 37 pounds. Amen. Praise God. And some of you are thinking, well, brother, you got a ways to go. We'll keep praying for you. You're right. But I had this conviction that came over me. Ginger had this conviction that if we're going to win the prize, we've got to be temperate in all areas. And for me, that included making a change in my diet. So I'm not preaching something to you that I haven't embraced myself. I'm telling you, if the Holy Spirit lays conviction on your heart to make a change, make a change. And I don't know what your downfall might be. Mine was pizza. Anybody like pizza? How is it that bread, tomato sauce, and cheese can taste so good? I don't know. There's got to be some sort of voodoo in it. It's just too good. Pastor, I always tell people I'm a vegan, but I'm a sucker for a slice of pizza. All right, well, I mean, listen, I don't want to be a stumbling block for you, you know, and, and, and I'm not vegan, but I've been making choices that help me bring my, my, my body temple more in such a way that it can honor God. Does that make sense? Yes. So I don't know what your struggle might be, but notice, go back to the scriptures. Let's look back at 1 Corinthians 9. Let's stay faithful. He says that if I'm going to run for this race, if I'm going to run for this prize, if I'm going to compete, I have to be temperate. And maybe for you, it's what you look at on the internet. Maybe it's working too much. I don't know where you might have imbalance in your life, but imbalance will destroy you. Amen. Now notice this third point. So far, our first point is there's a prize. That prize is eternal life. It's an upward call. Point number two, we have to be tempered in all things if we want the prize. Notice point number three. It's in the second half of verse 25. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. So in other words, the world's running for something that's going to burn. But we for what type of crown? An imperishable crown. Saints, when you and I are given the crown of life, it will last forever. And I want to be able to claim mine. Why? So I can stand on the sea of glass before the throne of grace, and I can cast my crown on his feet. How about you? Amen. I want to be a part of that group. Amen. Notice point number four comes in verse 26. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. In other words, I'm not confused. <laughs> you ask me if I'm securing my salvation, I'm not going to brag and say, oh yeah, I'm saved and I can't be shaken. Because that would be this once saved, always theology that we don't see biblically based. I can be taken out of the Lamb's book of life, as can you, yes or no? Yes. yes. But, what has Jesus told us? Fight. Fight? But he 
But he said, for God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So friends, if I choose Jesus, if I live for Jesus, can I have a level of certainty that he will ultimately save me? Absolutely. And I can't be arrogant and say, well, I gave my heart to Jesus 30 years ago. I haven't changed my mind. I've been living like the devil, but I'm still saved. No, you're not. <laughs> By your fruits, Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 20, you shall know them. And if you have fruits of iniquity, guess whose father you're serving? What did Jesus say in John chapter 8? He says the devil is the father of lies. Right? So friends, we, we can have certainty. And I love the last part of verse 30, excuse me, 26. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. Right? I'm not just shadow boxing in preparation. We actually are embroiled in spiritual combat. I'm not fighting with uncertainty. I'm not running with uncertainty. I'm running with assurance. So that's point number four. Now notice verse 27. This is the last point. We'll end with this. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Notice he wants us to be very certain and recognize very clearly that it's one time you could walk with God. But you can also walk away. Do you remember the parable that Jesus gave of the ten virgins? How many recall the story from Matthew 25? You had ten. My man remembers. There were ten of them. They all had oil, yes or no? Okay. Did they all have enough oil? No. But what does that tell me about the ten virgins? Number one, it tells me because they're classified, they're qualified as ten virgins, that tells me they were all church members. Because they had chosen to have no other spiritual relationship than with the Lord Jesus Christ, the bridegroom. Are you with me? The Holy Spirit, we know from Scripture, is represented symbolically by, by oil. All of them had a measure of the Holy Spirit, but at some point in waiting for Jesus, half of them let that connection with God go out of focus. Half of them did not keep their living connection with the Holy Spirit and so they, they read out. Right? They were all in the church. They all had a measure of the Holy Spirit. But some of them took their eyes off Jesus. Some of them got distracted. And went over into a spiritual traffic as it were. So if we don't think we can come into the church and eventually be lost. We're fooling ourselves. Now I don't know. I didn't look at uh, the membership records. I have access to the membership records of every church in the conference. We have 173 churches and companies, but with our missionary groups, we have 206 congregations here in Carolina. I don't know what your book membership is. I didn't look, but let me ask you this. Is everybody in the books of the Greenwood Church being faithful? Well, I'm not trying to cast judgment, but what are the odds? The odds are that not everybody's being faithful. So here's my point. Having your name on the church books, does that save you? If your name is only on the books of the church, but it's not in the Lamb's book of life, you have no salvation. Because unlike some other denominations, perhaps our Roman Catholic friends are the most prominent, the church is not the vehicle of salvation Jesus is. Amen. The church is simply a way that brings us to Jesus, gives us opportunities to experience Jesus. The church doesn't save me. The pastor cannot absolve you of your sins. I can't wave my hand over you and remove your sins. That's a connection between you and a living God. And if you don't have it on your own, you have no salvation. But if you have it, well, praise God, if you have it, you have salvation. Amen. Amen. He says, I don't want to preach to others. And I myself be disqualified. Saint says, I come to a close. I wonder if I might ask you just a simple question. Please listen to me closely. Are there any distractions in your life? Is there something that might be taking your eye off the prize of the upward call in Jesus Christ? Is there something that might be
keeping you from being the Christian that Christ has called you to be? I don't know. And I didn't call Pastor Edwards and say, listen, give me a rundown on how messed up the Greenwood Church is. I don't do that kind of stuff. Tell me who's doing what. Tell me what so I'll know what to preach about and who I can look in the eye. I didn't have that conversation. So I don't know what your struggles are. I don't know what your challenges are. But guess what? You do, and I can guarantee you that he does. Now here's my plea to you today. Are those distractions worth losing eternity? Do you think if that single mom who lost baby Rose had it to do over, if she had known by looking at your phone you're going to kill yourself and your baby, do you think she would have done something different? guarantee you she would have. Guess what? Today is your call to do something differently. Today is your call to make a change. And I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit taps on my shoulder too and says, hey preacher, you don't get a pass. If anything, I'm only going to hold you more accountable because you were called to preach to others. So I don't get a free pass. The only way I will find salvation is the same way you will. I need to have a daily saving relationship with Jesus Christ. In short, we've got to stay focused. So I close with this question. Those of you who see some distractions in your life, would you like Jesus to give you the power to look away from those distractions and to stay focused on him that you might win the eternal prize? I want to make that commitment today. Is there anybody that would like to make that commitment with me? Loving Father, oh Lord, I thank you that you were in the business of rescuing your children. And Father, sometimes this river of life seems to move so swiftly that no hand could reach out and snatch us out of the angry grasp of the river. But Lord, we know you not only have the ability, the ability to snatch us out of the river, you can stop the river. You stood up in the midst of a storm and you said, peace. Be still. The wind and the waves obeyed your command. So, Father, we know there is no storm in this life over which you do not have power. But today, Father, some of us are distracted. Some of us have let our focus get on other things. Some of us have allowed other things to take the place of first affection in our lives. And we've raised our hands and we've said, Lord, please see me. Please recognize my need today. Please save me. So, Father, I pray for those that are here, those that may be watching on Facebook. Lord, meet us at our point of need. Bring conviction over our hearts just now. Whatever is keeping us from being committed to you, help us to set it aside, to give it to you. Because, Lord, if we just set it aside, there's a chance we might pick it back up. But if we hand it over to you, if we let you take possession, you can take it away. So, Lord, may we set those things at the proverbial altar today. Speak to our hearts. Wash over us with the blood of Jesus, Father. Cleanse us every whit. Take away every spot, every stain. And clothe us with the robe of Christ's righteousness. Take away our filthy rags, Father. And I pray for this Greenwood Church. Lord, we have felt so blessed to worship here today, to enjoy Sabbath school, to make some new friends. So, Lord, I pray your special blessing upon this special congregation. Continue to use them to be a shining light in their communities, in their, their homes, their workplaces. If they run into a crying widow in the grocery store, give them a heart of compassion to minister to needs as they see them. I pray for this church's finances that you would bless them, that they would have the finances to not only maintain their facility, but to do evangelism in this community. I pray for the health of the members and ask your blessing upon each member, those here and those that are not able to be. And lastly, Father, I want to pray for Pastor Edwards. Help him to be the godly man, the leader and pastor that you need him to be. Bless he and his family. Thank you for their faithfulness. And Lord, thank you for hearing our prayer today. We pray these things by faith. And in Jesus' name, amen. amen.
for our closing hymn. Let's turn in our black hymnals to hymn number 326, Open My Eyes That I May See. And let's stand, please. 